San Francisco, 1906. On the morning of April the 18th, an earthquake shook the city to the ground. It was all over in 60 seconds. The San Andreas Fault, a break in the Earth's crust, had ripped open, causing almost total destruction. Another similar earthquake is inevitable, and probably soon. But San Francisco is not prepared. It has ignored warnings to protect itself that come from its own scientists. It is the city that waits to die, waits for the fault line to erupt once more. program looks at this city and some remarkable attempts to predict and even prevent the next earthquake. This is an original film record of the 1906 earthquake. Most people fled. A newspaper reported, San Francisco raised and hundreds of lives lost in terrible earthquake. The morgue overflows with the dead who died miserably. Damage, $50 million. Present situation, worse. Prospects, gloomy. Slowly, the city picked itself up and a new San Francisco rose from the ruins of the old. This, America's most attractive city, will be the victim of what promises to be one of the greatest natural disasters of the century. Director of the United States Geological Survey in California, Louis Perkiza. In terms of loss of life, the worst credible earthquake would probably occur during the rush traffic hour between 5 and 5.30 in the afternoon. And I think it's quite credible that the total loss of life in the San Francisco area from such an earthquake could be about as great as the total American loss of life in the war in Vietnam. That would be about 50,000 American lives in a single earthquake as opposed to 
years of war. Possibly as many as 50 or 100,000 is within the range of probabilities. Scientists believe that many of these lives could be saved. The key to saving them is understanding the causes of earthquakes. To do this, they have returned to the 1906 earthquake, the most closely analyzed earthquake in the world. It shook over 50,000 square miles of California. And afterwards, scientists observed in country lanes and farmers' fields an extraordinary series of breaks in the ground. stretched for over 200 miles, the longest surface break ever recorded. It followed the line of an ugly and unusual land formation that runs throughout California, the San Andreas Fault. From the air, it looks as if someone had dragged a knife across the land, leaving a jagged linear scar. Geologists suggested that this marked a break in the Earth's crust, which plunged downwards for 20 to 30 miles. The land surface, they argued, had ripped open because one side of the fault was trying to move northwards in respect to the other side. Pressures in the rocks had slowly built up until they were suddenly released like an uncoiled spring. The action of the rocks, lurching past each other, created the earthquake. This theory is now accepted. In 1906, the sudden movement tore apart farmers' fences by as much as 20 feet. Of the Californian Institute of Technology, Professor Clarence Allen. In some cases, we have been able to identify rock units that have been split by the fault. And we can now find the two halves of these rock units and see how far they are separated along the fault. For example, these two rocks I have in my hand are rocks taken from two different sides of the fault, 160 miles apart, but they are a very distinctive rock type. So similar, in fact, that we conclude that they must have at one time been together, part of a single rock unit that was split by the fault and separated so that they now lie 160 miles apart along a branch of the San Andreas Fault in the southern part of the state. Now, is that movement going on today still continuing? We have every reason to think that it is, not only from the earthquakes that are occurring, but also from certain types of surveying observations that suggest to us that one side of the fault is moving at a rate of about one inch, perhaps two inches per year, with respect to the other side. For example, the mountains over here are gradually moving towards the north, away from us, at a rate of perhaps one or two inches a year, relative to the rocks across the fault on the other side. Now, one inch is a year, one inch a year, may not sound like a very fast rate, but geologically, it's a very, very fast rate indeed. In fact, only within a very few tens of millions of years, San Francisco and Los Angeles, which now lie on opposite sides of the fault, will have been moved up to the point where they are juxtaposed. And the argument will then be, is Los Angeles a suburb of San Francisco, or is San Francisco a suburb of Los Angeles? The San Andreas Fault, as it approaches San Francisco, looks innocent enough. It follows the line of a reservoir, but no one knows why one side of the fault should move in respect to the other. Seismologists suspect it is caused by massive convection currents deep within the Earth itself. But it is known that the fault forms a moving boundary or join between two giant crustal blocks of the Earth's surface. One stretches westward out across the Pacific to Japan, the other out across America to Iceland. Sudden movements along this join cause 500 minor earthquakes a year which Californians can feel. Once every 50 years, it causes a catastrophic disaster. But sometimes the fault moves slowly and safely. Here in Hollister, the San Andreas Fault cuts right through the town, bending curbstones and roads.
it moves at the rate of half an inch per year, safely releasing the stress stored in the rocks. But in San Francisco, the fault does not release its energy by these slow movements. It is locked. There is enough unreleased strain stored in the rocks to cause a catastrophic 10 feet of movement. Indeed, San Francisco lies on the same fault system, the same continental boundary as Alaska and Peru, where 30,000 recently died. It is just as vulnerable as Americans were reminded in 1964. The city, Anchorage, Alaska. Good Friday, March 1964. The shops were closing. In the port of Valdez, the first freighter of the spring had come in. At dusk, a sailor took out his 8mm camera and filmed young children and their dogs on the quay below. Suddenly, the earth ruptured. One of the ships keels over. The whole harbour empties of water. The sailor somehow keeps his camera running. At the bottom of his picture, a deep crack opens directly alongside his ship. The sea comes flooding in. On the quay, the children and their dogs are gone. And in the city, shock waves were slightly bigger than those recorded in 1906. Afterwards, $400 million worth of damage. More than 100 died. Alaska has just one person for every square mile. Americans asked what would be the fate of urban areas along California's San Andreas Fault, where there are many thousands per square mile. They went on to launch a massive operation to predict earthquakes. Up 50 and left 20. To your right, Jerry. In the mountains near San Francisco, the world's most determined effort to predict the date of the San Francisco earthquake. From the top of Mount Diablo, geophysicists watch and measure the movement of mountains. They want to find out exactly how mountains move. Director of the United States Geological Survey in California, Louis Pekiza. Now here's uh, a little model of a fault zone. This is a fault. This is Mount Diablo. This is a fault at the foot of the mountain. This is a point at which we placed a laser distance measuring device, a geodolite. This is a point across the fault where we put a target on another mountain. This is another mountain where we put another target. Now, a swarm of earthquakes occurred in this area, and we measured this distance and this distance prior to the occurrence of that swarm of earthquakes. We also measured these distances after the swarm of earthquakes. If there was a movement along the fault during the occurrence of those earthquakes, we would expect this line to get longer and this line to get shorter. So we made that measurement, and that's exactly what we found. This line did get longer, this line did get shorter, and the horizontal movement along the fault at the time of the earthquakes, or in the interval during, between which those measurements were, were made, was about an inch. Helicopters and aircraft are part of the measuring operation, and also laser beams. Calibrate one. Calibrate one. Four, nine, two. Four, nine, two. Accurate measurements may give warning of changes in the movement of the fault which precede earthquakes. We want to measure those movements. We do this with an instrument that we call a geodolite. The geodolite is a laser distant distance measuring instrument. Geodolite sends out a beam of laser light, which is pure colored light. This particular light happens to be red, and transmits it along a path as far as uh, 50 miles away. This particular path is only 20 miles away. 
to a mirror or a reflector, and it's reflected back from that mirror and returns to the position of the instrument that sends out the, uh, the uh, light beam. We can also measure exactly how long it takes for that beam of light to go from the instrument here to the mirror and back again. So knowing the speed of light and knowing how long it took to travel that path, we can calculate the distance. We can calculate that distance very, very accurately. In fact, from this point to the point on the other side of the fault over there at Sunall, a little mountain above Sunall, we can calculate the distance within one millimeter or far less than a sixteenth of an inch. This is a very, very tiny distance. The helicopter and the aircraft are important because the optical properties of the air are not constant. But by carefully measuring the temperature along the path, carefully measuring the humidity at the ends of the path, and also along the path by flying aircraft and helicopters as near as possible to the line of sight, we can make corrections for those so that we can come up with an extremely ma uh, accurate measurement. So they guide uh, the airplane and they guide the helicopter along that line if they possibly can, and they come fairly close to doing so. Good line, good grade. Good line, good grade. Good line, good grade. Good line, good grade. From measuring points like Mount Diablo, data on earthquakes and fault movements are sent back, often simultaneously, to the Earthquake Research Center near San Francisco. The problem is analyzing the data. A first step is to display it. Dr. Darrell Wood. It is now possible to locate earthquakes just a few seconds after they arrive. What we're trying to do is couple a display of this type to the very rapid detection of these earthquakes and thereby almost instantaneously display the information. What I would like to show for you, to you now would be all of the earthquakes that have occurred in the year 1969 plus two years, two months in 1970. The earthquakes will be seen on this plan view of California. The longest diagonal straight line on the left is the San Andreas Fault. It runs down from San Francisco Bay. The two smaller diagonal lines on the right are branches of the fault. The time will be condensed by a factor of 1 million to 31 seconds. The dots that appear on the screen will be proportional to the size of the earthquake. If it is a large earthquake, it will be a large X. If it is a small earthquake, it will be a dot. The important thing to watch for are the patterns in the activity and where the earthquakes are occurring relative to these faults. I'd like to remind you that San Francisco is in the upper left-hand corner of the map. And you should also notice, as soon as we start the run, that the San Andreas Fault in the San Francisco region is not active. It's almost as if the fault is locked and refusing to yield its strain energy with the earthquakes. This lack of activity near San Francisco could very well be a very dangerous thing. All right, here we go. By now you have witnessed this fact that only a few very lonely earthquakes are occurring along the San Andreas Fault. The principal activity is on, along the southern area of the major faults. The next step is to display not earthquakes, but the small geophysical changes that precede large earthquakes, to display these as they happen, before the earthquakes occur. Recently, a swarm of small earthquakes hit the town of Danville, which lies at the foot of Mount Diablo. To the residents of Danville, if they'd been in bed at the time, these earthquakes would have felt as if a 20-stone man was shaking the bed. The key to predicting such earthquakes is detecting the warning signs which precede them. And in this case, 13 hours before the Danville earthquakes, there was a series of geophysical events that appeared to give warning of the earthquakes themselves. Hidden away in the mountains and valleys along the San Andreas Fault, instruments detected these changes. 
In particular, some showed that rock strata near San Francisco heaved or tilted 13 hours before the earthquakes. Here at the Stanford Linear Accelerator, one of the world's largest computers processed the data before the earthquakes took place and displayed it. From the top of the screen, a line will appear and point to the earthquake as the rocks actually tilt. Here it comes. Now the anomalous activity begins. The arrow is shortening, indicating tilt up away from the fault. It is now starting to rotate in the direction of the epicenter and it's pointing to the earthquakes. The tilt activity around the fault forces the tilt to go northward. That's the end of the sequence. What we need to do is have a system of this type that will allow us to cross correlate this information in the, at, simultaneously while earthquakes are occurring. Are the Americans optimistic after these first hopeful signs? If the San Francisco earthquake does not occur within the next five years, it's my opinion that we will be able to predict it. Here in the Japanese village of Matsushiru, scientists have already predicted the date of some earthquakes. But unlike San Francisco, the earthquakes have been easy to predict and are something of a scientific curiosity. Over 600,000 small earthquakes have been recorded here since 1965 and they've left their mark. The Japanese have measured the geophysical events which preceded the earthquakes. Instruments continuously recorded them as on the San Andreas Fault. As a result, scientists here were able to give radio bulletins actually predicting the earthquakes. These were accurate enough for a cameraman to have his camera ready and actually film in one of the smaller earthquakes. The houses rock gently with the ground motion. People in Matsushiru became so blasé, they even cycled down the streets. One geologist even predicted a landslide and evacuated a village before it was destroyed. Matsushiro's earthquakes were relatively easy to predict, but San Francisco is a much more difficult job. Scientists want to predict earthquakes to within three days to allow for evacuation. This is still in the future. In the short term, San Francisco can only learn from previous earthquakes and cut her losses. Again, Japan, the morning of June the 16th, 1964. The Japanese town of Niigata hit by an earthquake. Like parts of San Francisco, it was built on low-lying land, much of it reclaimed from the sea. It flooded because it was sited on geologically dangerous ground. The trouble was a quicksand condition called liquefaction. But it is now possible to limit an earthquake's destructiveness by proper planning which would avoid such places. Knowing the dangers is the first step. What exactly happened in Niigata? of the University of California, Professor Harry Seed. The phenomenon can readily be de de described and shown in the laboratory with the aid of this device, which is a quicksand device. 
It's a container containing sand, which is saturated. The water table is currently about a half an inch below the ground surface. The container is fastened to this large shaking table, and the table can be programmed to shake just like an earthquake. When I start this table shaking, the sand will be vibrated. It will liquefy. It may take a little while before it does liquefy. And then this house, which can easily be supported by the sand under normal conditions, will sink into the sand. I'm going to start the table now. The vibrations are starting over here. You can see the vibrations by this little wire attached to the house. And in due course, the house will sink down into the sand. The sand loses its strength as it is shaken to the point where the particles lose contact with each other. There is no longer any friction between them and the sand collapses. The best known recent example of liquefaction is in the Niigata earthquake of 1964. This was a magnitude seven and a half earthquake and the town of Niigata was located about 35 miles from the epicenter. Uh, soon after the earthquake started, water was observed, was observed to be bubbling out of the ground in Niigata. This led to a quicksand condition developing or a liquefaction condition developing in the area around the river which flows through Niigata and when the ground liquefied, buildings sank into the ground. Many buildings sank three feet or four feet, and some of them tilted in the process. Uh, and a, a department store tilted to an angle of about 28 degrees, but the most dramatic example of building tilting occurred in some apartment buildings at Karagishi Cho, where one apartment building tilted to an angle of 80 degrees. The building itself remained in one piece. It was a four-story building, and it slowly turned over during the earthquake till it lay on its side. And after the earthquake, people removed their belongings from the building by rolling wheelbarrows down the side, down the face of the building, to get their things out of their apartments. The building was structurally in perfect condition. I went through that building after the earthquake. There were no hair cracks, no cracks of any kind in the building. It was just in a very inconvenient position to live after the earthquake was over. These craters show where the water had come to the surface in Niigata. In the 1906 earthquake, similar craters and signs of liquefaction. In a small earthquake in 1957, again liquefaction. In San Francisco, a highway slid into the lake. The supports for a bridge slid. What are the risks in San Francisco? There are some deposits in the Bay Area which are vulnerable to liquefaction. Uh, we have a number of hydraulic sand fills in the Bay Area. Uh, these are loose sand deposits, and I believe they would be vulnerable to liquefaction during earthquakes. The margins of San Francisco Bay, as in Niigata, are often lands reclaimed from the sea. They support expensive new housing projects. A very thorough investigation is always necessary to reveal which parts of the Bay are vulnerable to liquefaction. A first step in making any earthquake-prone city safer is to investigate geological hazards and to stop building in dangerous areas. And some hazards are very obvious. A branch of the San Andreas Fault runs through the crowded suburbs of Berkeley and Oakland. It is slowly pulling apart Berkeley University Stadium by about half an inch a year. There are also public buildings on the fault, including schools. At one of them, a seismologist, Dr. Barry Raleigh. In California, when there's a large earthquake, the fault shifts. The ground displaces, and one side moves relative to the other by perhaps 10 to 20 feet in a great earthquake. If the school is actually lying on top of the fault trace at that time, a lot of the classrooms will be destroyed, and a lot of the kids inside will be killed. There is no excuse for building any building on top of an active fault. If the public officials are not aware that those schools are there, then they ought to be. And if they are aware, then something damn well should be done about it. The Adams Junior High School. There are 1,153 children in this school. 
it is on the fault. The Mira Vista School, there are 870 children in this school, it is on the fault. There are no less than 13 schools built directly on the fault trace. In them, 5,000 children. Also directly on the fault, the police department, the nerve centre for disaster operations. And by the side of the police station, the civil defence operations room. And nearby, also on the fault, is the county hospital. All would cease to operate in a big earthquake. The public has not been told of the real dangers. The size of the forthcoming disaster depends on the ability of public officials to draw on geological knowledge and plan accordingly. So far, throughout the Bay Area, they have not made a very good job of it. Building on faults can be solved easily. But just how safe are skyscrapers? Every year, they confidently rise higher and higher and higher. How do buildings react to the ground shaking beneath them? This is an earthquake resistant building. After a recent earthquake in the Philippines, this is what happened to the support columns. The Long Beach earthquake of 1933 gives us one of the few accurate records of ground shaking. From this, the movements of a modern 10-story building can be calculated at the Californian Institute of Technology, Professor George Hausner. This structure then, this is a model of a 10-story building, will vibrate in the same way that a building vibrated during the Long Beach earthquake. So that what we see here is essentially the motion of a 10-story building to the Long Beach earthquake. At the top of the building, you would <coughs> experience a swaying of several inches in amplitude, and this would be strong enough to topple filing cabinets and bookcases. And if the building is not designed correctly, it will collapse. For example, if the columns are too weak, the building will collapse, or if the girders are not strong enough, again, the structure will collapse. Uh, if I turn it on now, you will see how the ground shook during the Long Beach earthquake, and how the 10-story building would respond. Beach earthquake was small. San Francisco was 600 times bigger. Is there enough data to predict ground shaking in a big earthquake? Dr. Hausner. No, uh, we have never recorded the motion of a building in a strong earthquake. Does this concern you for somewhere like San Francisco? Yes. Uh, actually, most earthquakes in the world, most destructive earthquakes in the world are not recorded in a way meaningful to engineering design. Earthquake engineers have to rely on their own experience of past earthquakes. But just how good is that experience in big earthquakes? One of California's leading engineers is Henry Dagenkolb. When you consider that the San Francisco earthquake was a Richter magnitude of eight and a quarter and about 8.4 for Alaska, and the magnitude, uh, the energy release, increases by a factor of about 30 for every point in the magnitude. It means that our information for big earthquakes or great earthquakes is almost entirely lacking. So you haven't got the information from, from a large earthquake with which to design buildings? That is correct. We do not have. Earthquake-resistant buildings in Caracas, the capital of Venezuela. The engineers claimed that buildings like these were probably safe. But in a recent earthquake, some collapsed. In the earthquake of July 1969, 400 died, 100,000 were homeless. 
The ground shook for 90 seconds. San Francisco engineers had some unpleasant surprises. Designed close to Californian standards, this luxurious 12-story building collapsed. Its floors pancaked one on top of another. 47 died, two survived. The Nevery apartment building also collapsed. It pitched into the street. 44 died. These buildings collapsed in one small earthquake. They were built according to some of the best earthquake codes in the world. The University of California sent a team to Caracas to investigate. They discovered that one out of every three high-rise buildings sited on deep soil were seriously damaged. The reason? Deep soil increases the intensity of the shock waves. But California's engineers have not allowed for this in their building codes. How safe, therefore, are San Francisco's skyscrapers? Most were built before there was any precise knowledge of the effect of building on deep soil. These buildings are probably four times more vulnerable to damage than skyscrapers built close to a rock foundation. They may need greater safety requirements. Some are probably over-designed and safe. But no one has the scientific evidence to say categorically they are safe. The evidence suggests that in a big earthquake, their performance is still unknown. The question is, what are the risks? And should such uncertainties be tolerated? An earthquake engineering supervisor with the state of California, Renner Hoffman. Now, downtown high-rise buildings in San Francisco are not built to withstand failure. They are built to not move very much for a very small earthquake force. And having done so, our engineers tell us that these buildings probably will not fail when shaken by the much more severe vibrations that are known to accompany large earthquakes. What evidence do they have for that? There is no evidence whatever that's been developed to, to make these statements. But surely this is an extremely serious situation. Then. It is a very grave situation indeed. Why is it tolerated? Tolerated principally because this, uh, the building codes that are presently used were developed at a time when we really didn't know any better. We now know better. But the economic pressures to continue expanding the city, to continue to build high-rise buildings, is greater than it ever was before. There are about 300,000 people who live and work in downtown San Francisco. Well, that means we have a potential for 100,000 deaths when the next really big earthquake occurs here. little that can be done about skyscrapers once they've been built. But scientists have also been unable to persuade their city to invest in reasonable earthquake precautions that could save a lot of lives. Precautions that should proceed continuously year by year. Meanwhile, San Franciscans wait for their earthquake, unaware of the full extent of the danger. The ultimate answer to earthquakes is the hitherto science fiction dream of preventing them. That this might be a serious possibility was first suggested by underground nuclear explosions. These explosions triggered the first historic step towards the idea of prevention. They created man-made earthquakes. At the UN
U.S. Geological Survey in San Francisco, Dr. Barry Raleigh. At the time of an explosion, the ground moves uh, by large amounts vertically. Uh, the explosion itself sends out very large seismic waves, and earthquakes do occur. And the way this is known is that uh, people who went out on the test site afterwards found very large rifts in the ground, extending for several miles in each direction, with a vertical shift of perhaps a few feet. And these must have been, at the time they were produced, very large earthquakes. I mean, if you'd been standing out there, you might have been shaken rather badly. If you'd been carrying a bottle around on a shelf, it might have fallen off. They're that sort of earthquake. Now, <clears throat> these were shown to occur after the explosion. They didn't know until they took movies that they actually occurred right at the time of the explosion. And uh, looking at the movies, one can see dust rising off the place where the ground breaks. Uh, there are also a large number of small earthquakes following the explosions that can be recorded right here uh, in this room uh, following the explosions immediately. The data is brought in over telephone lines and shows up as wiggly lines here on the traces on the screen. Uh, Dr. Edward Keller, the father of the H-bomb, suggested that perhaps nuclear explosions could be used to relieve the energy that's built up along some of the major faults like the San Andreas and prevent large earthquakes in the future. And of course, that would uh, have a great effect on San Francisco. <clears throat> but I, I think no one really takes that very seriously. The nuclear explosions are a very large and sudden event. And the danger, of course, is that they might trigger a very large earthquake. And the effect on San Francisco might, in fact, not be a very beneficial one. If bombs were too uncontrolled to make a fault slip slowly and safely, the explosions at the Nevada test site did suggest for the first time that earthquakes might be prevented, if a way could be found of inducing the San Andreas fault to slip smoothly and so release its strain energy gradually rather than letting it build up for a big earthquake. Denver, Colorado. Here, the idea of preventing earthquakes was taken a significant stage further in a bizarre episode which showed there were other ways of making a fault move. Denver had been an earthquake-free town until, in the early 60s, it was shaken by a mysterious series of 710 earthquakes. They were strong enough to shake hundreds of bottles from the shelves of local shops. This one, a liquor store. But their cause was a mystery, until an accusing finger was pointed at none other than the United States Army. The Army's Rocky Mountain Arsenal lay outside Denver, and inside was a disposal well for the fluid waste products from the manufacture of nerve gas. Fluid pressure caused the earthquakes, claimed a Denver geologist, David Evans. Right here, near the Rocky Mountain Arsenal, is a disposal well, a hole in the ground almost three miles deep. Since 1961, the liquid waste from this manufacture of nerve gas had been pumped down this hole in the ground. The total volume is about 150 million gallons of fluid that's been pumped down this hole into cracked basement rocks, cracked or faulted rocks. Now, what happens when these cracks are pushed open, if they're trying to slide past each other, the friction between blocks of rock is, is decreased along those cracks. And I have a beer can here with holes punched in the bottom. Now, this, this beer can represents one block of rock. The board upon which it is resting represents another block of rock. And as you can see, that, that the beer can is trying to slide down this incline. Now, but it's not moving, it's held still by, by, by friction. Now watch what happens when we raise the fluid pressure by pouring liquid into the can. Movement takes place when you raise the fluid pressure between the can and, and, and the board. The vibration of those moving rocks was picked up as an earthquake by the seismographs in, in, in the area. Evans produced this chart. The upper level shows earthquake frequency plotted in black. The lower shows the monthly injection of nerve gas waste. The peaks on both charts coincided. There were large numbers of earthquakes when large amounts of fluid were injected. The army, caught in an embarrassing corner, denied it. The citizens of Denver angrily demanded a government investigation. The geological survey moved in, and Dr. Barry Raleigh finally traced the earthquakes right to the well. 
It was demonstrated that the earthquakes were, in fact, related to the well in space. They occurred along a line that extended right through the Arsenal well and headed off to the northwest. Now, this was a city of, in the broad area around Denver, of a million people, and there was a great deal of concern about it. So that our participation and our showing that the well and the earthquakes at least were related meant that the Army uh, had to do something about it, and they responded by shutting down the operation. The earthquakes stopped. For the first time, man had started an earthquake and actually turned it off. Of course, we were all extremely excited at the possibility that we could stop earthquakes. This is uh, something that would have been science fiction a few years ago, and uh, really nothing any reputable scientist would have even mentioned. But Denver, it appeared, for the first time, gave us some real hope that this was possible. The difficulties in carrying on the experiment at Denver made it necessary that we go somewhere else to try to find another place that uh, there were earthquakes that might be related to fluid pressures. And our first leads came from the other most seismically active area in Colorado, which is out in the western part of the Colorado, near a small town named Rangeley. Rangeley, like Denver, has been hit by a mysterious series of earthquakes. It lies on the edge of a very big, very productive oil field, and, as in Denver, the earthquakes are related to water. 10 million gallons a day have been pumped into the oil field every single day for the last 12 years to help recover the oil. Scientists believe that this gigantic pumping operation is causing Rangeley's earthquakes, and they suspect that water pressure, rather than uncontrolled nuclear explosions, could be the key to preventing earthquakes. Rangeley, it seems, could provide the answers. Today, Dr. Raleigh has in effect taken over the oil field for what may be one of the most important scientific experiments ever conducted. At Rangeley, there are oh, as few as one to as many as 50 earthquakes a day. What we'd like to do, if we can, is to control them, to turn them on, turn them off at will. and. If we are successful, the kind of understanding of, of what makes earthquakes that should come out of that should help us control them elsewhere, perhaps by injection of fluid, perhaps not. But at least we'll know enough about earthquakes at that point so that the chances of successfully modifying faults so that they don't 